Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, he led the Anzala ala abdihi kitab, wa lam yaj'al lahu awaja. Qayyima, liyundira ba'san shadidan min ladun. Wa yubashir al-mu'minin al-ladhina ya'amaloon al-salihati anna lahum ajran hasana. Ma kithina fihi abada. Wa yundira al-ladhina qalu attakhad allahu walada. Ma lahum bihi min ilm. Wa la li abaihim. كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم إن يقولون إلا كذبا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وإليه ترجع الأمور وأشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا فهو الرحمة المحداة والنعمة المصداة والسراج المنير اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله الأطهار وأصحابه الأخيار ومن اتبع سنته وسار على نهجه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فيا أيها الإخوة المؤمنون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة وأولو العلم قائما بالقسط صدق الله العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى says in his book Allah himself bears witness that there is no deity save he and the angels and the people of knowledge upright in just balance they also testify. This is a famous ayah that in some parts of the ummah is traditionally written over the mihrab of the musalla of a madrasa. I've seen it myself many times. And that is always in the design of a masjid where the Qur'an is where the eye rests because the masjid is the place where the Qur'an is there to bind us to the world of eternity. An important choice. Sometimes it's the famous verse of the mihrab about uh, Sayyidatna Maryam. But sometimes it's this verse, particularly in some of the very old mosques and very ancient madrasas of Islam. Way back in the time of the Abbasid dynasty, they like to write this in hieratic, beautiful, formal, difficult, Kufic script above the mihrab, where the great ulama were going to be reading Allah's book. Allah himself bears witness that there is no deity save he. And so do the angels, and so do the people of knowledge, upright in just balance. This verse is very characteristic of the way in which Allah's book puts things in order. The most important thing is the divine unity. And the most disastrous thing is to lose sight of the divine unity. Shirk, the only unforgivable sin. Everything else, Allah can just say, oh well, and into paradise the sinner goes. But that, not quite. That is where the door slams tightly shut. Everything else, Allah in his mercy, arham ar rahimin anything is possible. So that's the first thing, the unity. The greatest of all catastrophic human misunderstandings is to look at the many things in the universe and the physical laws, and the directions of the compass, and the heat, and the cold, and the colors, and the smells, and the majesty, and the immensity, and the complexity, and the order of it all, this qist, and to say, well, I don't think that comes from anywhere in particular. Or to say, I think maybe there's two people at work here, or maybe a whole bunch of them, like the ancient Greeks and the Romans with all of their gods and goddesses fighting it out, uh, competing for bits, of the created world, that's a fundamental error. And to have that at the depth of your soul as the foundation stone of everything else that you do in your life, the basis for your morality, the understanding of what the world is about, where it comes from, who guides it, where it's going after it comes to an end, that is the ultimate calamity. Shirk is the, the ultimate crack that destroys the, the, the architecture 
of the human creature. Allah himself bears witness. He is ala kulli shay'in shaheed. He witnesses all things. Not the way we witness some things. Not the way we can log on to some webcam somewhere and see what's going on. Or the way in which GCHQ perhaps can look at us through our smartphones when we don't know. No, that's not the shahada, the witnessing, which is related to the divine witnessing, which is beyond any possibility of veiling. He sees everything. At all times he sees us. <coughs> he sees our past, he sees our present, he sees our future. He knows the cancer as it grows within us. He knows the thoughts as they grow within us. He knows ala kulli shayin shaheed, inconceivable, unimaginable, total transparency. Allah sees this because he sees everything in the world. He sees the totality of it. He is the first to bear witness to the fact that he is one. There isn't a whole bunch of things competing to make the world the place that it is. One, only one, sets the constant that is the constant of the law of gravity. Only one determines what the speed of light will be. Only one determines the mass of the proton. There's nothing else that is determining these things. The fundamental shaping laws of the universe determined by al-wahid. If there were others and it was a fight, well, the world as we see it, and understand it, and inhabit it, and breathe its air, would be impossible. Only one. And the angels also see this, because the angels have a particular way of witnessing that also sees the world transparently. They're not capable of sin. They can't look at things and say, well, maybe there's a whole bunch of things that are the ultimate cause of that. They can't disobey their Lord. And so they also witness. That's why they say, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Always, what else can they do when they see only he in the, in the complexity of creation? They have no choice. If they have a choice, they're not angels, and we know that once happened. But the angels, the great ones, they only, they witness. That's what they do. They bear witness to the only thing that is absolute. Everything else, contingent, possible. He alone is absolute. He alone guarantees what is in the world. He is the one who is the living in himself, al-qayyum, self-subsistent, but also the one who upholds everything else. And there is no outside the cosmos, which is beyond the limits of his grasp, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kullul lahu qanitun. So the angels bear witness. And then the verse goes on, and ulul ilm, people of knowledge. And this is where the mind gets to work and thinks, people of knowledge, who is that? Well, you could say some scientists have this perception if they really look deeply, but basically scientists only see part of the picture. They do some equations and not the others. They don't have the complete uh, divine or angelic overview of it all. They're living in two dimensions on the surface and don't see it from above. But that ulul ilm, the people of knowledge, that this beautiful verse refers to are the people of knowledge of the divine. It's talking about the ulama. So the great Imam Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani, or Imam al-Haramain al-Juwaini, or Imam al-Ghazali, or al-Suyuti, or uh, al-Dahlavi, or the great ulama of Islam, as they stand in that mihrab, forgetting those who are behind them, remembering only the one who is before them, who alone will judge the quality of their prayer. And above it, they see this verse. They remember the maqam al-Khilafah they can actually bear witness through not just their participation in the physical laws of the universe, their submission to that, but in an understanding of it, a witnessing of it, which nothing else in the physicality of creation can do. A rock, my overcoat, the sun and the moon, everything that has a physical existence that doesn't have aql, mind, bears witness through its lisan al-hal, its own beingness in the world, to the unity of the Creator. But what it can't do is to bear witness by speaking of this, the way Allah and his angels and the ulama can. They can't do that. It is mute eloquence. They're just there testifying to the divine qualities, but they can't make us hear their testimony. We can only observe it for ourselves. So there's something strange about Bani Adam and the strangeness is encapsulated in the Qur'anic vision by the fact that we can speak The fact that we can have categories. 
the fact that we can do ethics, the fact that we can perceive what is beautiful and what is ugly, the fact that we can do things that aren't in our immediate hedonistic interest, <laughs> the fact that we can theorize out so many things, the fact that we can have great universities, the fact that we can do mathematics, all of these extraordinary things are just for the Benny Adam. And the Benny Adam behind all of this has to be able to bear witness to the unity, which presupposes the existence of the creator Al-Bari Jalla Thana'u. So this is the greatness of the ulama. But this verse is not really talking about people who just have a whole bunch of facts in their heads. This witnessing is not about that. The witnessing is about using those facts in order to perceive. The shahida, shahada, is to testify, but also to see. Shahida, yashhad, or to bear witness, but also to see. Something mushahad in the Arabic language is something you can see. And there is the ghaib, and there is the shahada, the unseen, and there is the seen. They bear witness to this because they see it, and all of the knowledge they have is only important to them and only makes them ulama, qa'iman bil qist, if they can see what it means. So this is why that, that slogan, that motto, that beautiful ayah is used so much and has transformed the hearts of so many of our great ones because in a sense it is a warning to the scholars. It is a warning that if all they are is just like a computer hard drive, whole bunch of memories in there and statistics and files and they can regurgitate them to give khutbahs and to get jobs or whatever it else it is that those things might be useful for, or even give fatwas, or even help people in various religious ways if that's all they are, just a hard drive with a whole bunch of facts, then they're not really scholars. But what Anne is saying, it's about bearing witness, testifying to the unity. Now the great ulama of this ummah have always striven to encourage us to see the unity of all of the parts of religion. Imam al-Ghazali in his Ihya al madin has a section uh, of the, a list of ten things which the student has to be aware of. And the first one, as you'd expect, is self-knowledge and self-purification. Be aware of your intentions. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ niyat. But one of them is an awareness of the mutual interlinking of the ulum shar'iyya. You don't just learn a, a lot of tafsir and you don't really know your fiqh, and you don't know the hadith, and you don't know your kalam, and you can't prove the existence of God, and you don't really know the akhlaq. No, that's not how to bear witness. That's not a scholar who is shahida, who is bearing witness. That's just somebody who knows a whole bunch of stuff, even if it's full of light and luminosity and blessings, and he can recite the prophetic words and the divine words. It's not the same as bearing witness. So we have to have this ru'ya mutakamila, this... Uh, comprehensive vision. And Imam al-Ghazali is quite hard on those who just hyper-specialize. It's a problem in the modern university. Just down the road there, you've got the Department of Pure Mathematics, people who spend their lives just working out certain complex equations. And then just down there, you've got the Faculty of English, where people are writing dissertations on Macbeth. And do they talk to each other? Not a whole lot. You've got the Faculty of Medicine, the fact of modern scholarship is fragmentation. That fragmentation makes it difficult for people to see the whole story, which is one reason why it's almost inevitable that modern university is quite a secular space, because people are not really olamat. They don't really have this Renaissance vision of knowing a whole load of things. They are hyper-specialized, idiot savants. But the alim is not to be that. The alim is to be the one who has at least a good grasp of all of the olam. He's likely to specialize in one or two, but he knows the other things as well. So again, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, whose amazing commentary on Bukhari is one of the great monuments of Islamic literature, Fath al-Bari, Sharh Sahih al-Bukhari, which took him years and years to complete. And he went into a kind of retreat in Cairo at the Khanqa of Sultan Baybars in order to write this astounding encyclopedic thing, which is in 30, 40 volumes, depending on who's printing it. An immense ocean of knowledge the wellspring of the ulama's understandings of what they can find in, in the prophetic hadith of, of al-Bukhari, a monument. That even though he's known as a hadith scholar, in the commentary you can see that he knows the other things as well. 
not enough just to memorize hadith, to be ahl al-hadith, to be muhaddith, in order to understand and ultimately to bear witness to the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-wahid, al-qahar, you have to have the things that he brings in, the theology, the uh, kalam, the science of, sciences of the Arabic language, logic, sirah, all of these things are necessary to have a complete Islamic vision. And the book itself turns into an amazing testimony for Islam. It's, it's a wonder. You see how each of the little jewel-like fragments of the prophetic diction can serve lovingly like a treasure passed down the generations. You can imagine if your family had an heirloom, say a big diamond, it would go down the generations and you'd make sure that the diamond was still there. These are the treasures that the Holy Prophet is bequeathing to his successors and to ourselves. And the ulama are the ones who hand them down the generations. And from these diamonds and these rubies and these emeralds and these sapphires, they find this luminescence. Sometimes you'll find 30 or 40 different meanings in a single hadith and each one enriches you as a Muslim. Why? Because he has this comprehensive vision. And he's been lifted up. He knows the meaning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, يَرْفَعُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَأُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ درجات. Allah raises up those who have iman and those who have knowledge to high degrees. The alternative is to be something potentially very subversive. And the ulama have always uh, warned us against that. Imam al-Bukhari right at the beginning of this amazing collection of hadiths, which has hypnotized and entranced and delighted the scholars for so many centuries, for 12 centuries, begins with the book of the beginning of Revelation, Kitab al-Bad al-Wahi. That's a logical place to start, the collection of prophetic hadiths. But right at the beginning of that, he surprises us by giving us a hadith that doesn't seem to be about the beginning of Revelation and the angel coming to Hira and Iqra and that great story. Before that, you get the hadith Actions are only by intentions. In other words, you're only credited for what you intended by a thing. Whoever's hijrah, this was the great event in early Islam, people remembered it and people knew they had different intentions. Whoever's hijrah was for Allah and his messenger, his hijrah was for Allah and his messenger. In other words, he'll be credited with that great intention. For man kanat hijratuhu li dunya yusibuha aw imra'atin yankihuha fa hijratuhu ila ma hajra ilay. And whoever's hijrah was for a dunya thing that he wanted, something in Medina that he could get his hands on, or a woman who he wanted to marry, then his hijrah was for that. Why does he start the book of the beginning of Revelation with a hadith that's not about the beginning of Revelation? He puts it there as a warning to himself. He's saying, don't be proud, uh, don't be proud, uh, Bukhari. You're writing this amazing thing that's going to change the world and is the core of the ummah ever since. <clears throat> but don't boast, because only Allah knows if your intention is a good one. In other words, you're only bearing witness. You're only carrying the shahada. You're only testifying to the unity of your creator, which is what religion is to help humanity to do. Ultimately, from the beginning to the end, it's about that. If your intention is right. Otherwise, you're just kind of carrying a whole bunch of hadiths to another generation and you're just like a hard drive or something you can download from the internet. And it doesn't really have any human quality to it and isn't bearing witness to anything at all because it can't speak the danger of scholarship. And this is Aafatul Ilm. And the effort of ilm has a lot to do with pride. The Holy Prophet says in another hadith, لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ آفَ وَآفَةُ الْعِلْمِ الْخُيَلَاء There's some beautiful hadiths in which he says everything has a particular weakness and the weakness of a particular thing is such and such a thing. So, آفَةُ tijara al الْكَذِبِ We're thinking about that. The, the weakness, the vice uh, of doing business is to tell lies, in other words, to sell some, somebody something without really telling them what it is, or to say you're going to pay at a particular date but without having that intention. That's the besetting vice of the person who's in business. And he warns us, sallallahu alayhi wa against that. And then he says, وَأَفَتُ الْعِلْمِ الْخُيَلَاءِ And the, the weakness, the pitfall, 
The Achilles heel of knowledge is pride, vainglory, which is serious because that's actually worse than lying. If you put it in the list of the seven deadly sins which Islam has, the sab'al mubiqat, it's right up there. Why is pride such a deadly sin? Because it's the one that can't coexist with the fear of God. Because you're kind of putting yourself into the divine position. He alone is al-mutakabbir, al-jabbar. What are you doing being proud? That's a fundamental misunderstanding akin to idolatry. You are Allah's slave. That's it. So the danger of the scholar is this, this ego trip, that he just has a lot of knowledge and he gets some kind of maybe dunya uh, facilities as a result of that knowledge. And this has been something that the ulama have always been worried about and warned against and sometimes been tempted by then as now. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا أَسْفَارًا بِئْسَ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِي الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ The likeness of those who were under the yoke of the Torah, burdened with, carried, given to carry the Torah, and then didn't carry it, uh, is like a donkey carrying books or carrying scrolls. It's an obvious and alarming image. The scholar in ancient Israel, there were these scholars who knew their Torah and their Talmud, but they didn't really have an integrative religious vision. It was just a way to make a crust of bread or to get status in the eyes of people, whatever else they might have used their knowledge for. That was a possibility. And then... Allah says, woe betide those who deny our signs. Why does he say that after telling us about the donkey and the books? Because Allah's signs are everywhere, in the books and on the horizons, and if you're denying those, even though you're full of the signs, and the books have tell you, told you how to read the signs, and still you're not reading the signs, then you're really in trouble. Like somebody who spends his whole life learning Sanskrit, for instance, but he just learns the shape of the letters and he learns the alphabet and he memorizes the dictionary, but he doesn't actually know the language. He doesn't communicate. He doesn't read texts. Sometimes scholars can be like that. The purpose of ilm is to enable us to read the world, to know what it means in its deep reality, to see it as signs so that we can bear witness to the being and the unity of the one who is the author of the world. That's what Islamic scholarship is ultimately about, to enable us to testify. But, well, there are some people who don't quite get around to doing that because uh, academics have a lot of other stuff to do and committees and conferences. No, it's testifying to, to the unity. Uh, and Allah does not guide the, the people of darkness, the people of injustice. And this is a, a verse which, according to the many of the people of tafsir, was revealed in connection with something that is, in the, of the, is there in the stories of the ancient Israelites and it's alluded to in the Bible and it's certainly in the Talmud, which is a certain Bal'am bin Be'or in Hebrew. And according to the story, this was a sage, a wise man, a rabbi, if you like, from the people of, of Moses, alayhi salam. Moses knew he was a scholar and sent him to be a messenger to the king of of Midian, Madian, who was not uh, a believer, hoping that he would, because of his knowledge, be able to negotiate with that king and cut a deal that would be favorable to the Israelites who were going to come across the Red Sea and into uh, the land of, of, of the Midianites. And when he gets there, and the story is elaborate, and I'll cut, cut it short, he, because of the immensity of his knowledge, and according to some of the ulama of tafsir, so great was his knowledge that he even knew al-ism al-a'zam, the greatest name, by which, according to some accounts, if Allah is prayed to, then he will grant a response. And the king of Midian says, well, here is a treasure. Here is a chest of gold and jewels and a chariot of silver. Come over onto my side and maybe I'll listen to your religion. We can cut a deal. We can negotiate. You don't have to be, it doesn't have to be then against us. Well, maybe paganism has something to be said for it, and let's see where we can cut this deal. And he accepts this bribe. He becomes 
a kind of, if you like, state mufti, I don't know what the contemporary equivalent would be, for somebody who is corrupt, evil, manipulative, not a, a, a witness bearer. And the king of Midian says, well, I want you to use his greatest name. I want you to use all this knowledge that you have of the five books of Moses in order to bring seven calamities upon his people. Just seven calamities, and then um, everything will, will be sorted out. According to some accounts, he actually does this with his immense knowledge and his ilm and the then equivalent of hadith and tafsir and nahu and sarf and mantaq, a great scholar. But Allah turns those calamities to blessings because he will not, according to this ayah here, those who are denying his signs. He will not. The prayer of such people, the diana of such people is ineffectual. They are not truly men of religion. So the contemporary meaning of this, well, it's a, an eternal meaning, is that you have to be clear about your ikhlas and your tawheed. It doesn't matter what manipulations dunya might be attempting. It doesn't matter what agenda might be creeping in. And you might think yourself incredibly sophisticated because you're taking on board all kinds of stakeholders. One has to act and operate and get by in a complex world. But unless you have this ultimate bearing witness to the unity of all things and the compassion of the one who is sustaining all things and to the eventual judgment of all things and all souls by al-wahid al-qahar, then you're just part of the scenery. You're just part of the, 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 the give and take of dunya. You're just another phenomenon in the manifest world and you're not rising up to the status of, of bearing witness. And that is a calamity. In the Nair age, many of the Muslims are disappointed or confused by some of the scholars who seem to be in state positions or engaging in certain agendas of certain governments. Sometimes one has to engage with. You know, even Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam has to talk to Fir'aun. Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam has a job with the Pharaoh of his age. It's, it's not intrinsically wrong, but remember the prophetic priority that it's for testifying to the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And anything else that you might be playing with that makes you feel so cool and sophisticated uh, is actually just ru'onet in nafs, the turbulences of the ego and an evidence of your, uh, your, da your uh, dance with the spiritual death of hypocrisy. We need to watch out for that. And so the meaning of all of this is that learning sacred knowledge and at CMC we constantly try to inculcate this learning sacred knowledge is not an end in itself if you want you can teach your computer all the hadith that have ever existed it can do it quicker than any human being but that's not the point we teach human beings those things because human beings unlike computers are able to testify in themselves to be living representatives of somebody who is Khalifa of that extraordinary individual, that unique phenomenon in creation to whom the angels could legitimately bow down. That astonishing beginning of the human story, the angels bow down to us, created of clay, because we have this ruh within ourselves, which is the center of everything that makes us ourselves truly. Everything that makes us able to be moral, able to discern good from evil, able to tell good, uh, beauty from ugliness, able to act altruistically, and ultimately, through all of those things, able to see the one, al-wahid subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the many, which is the most fundamental testimony for which human beings were created. We don't have any other purpose but to worship and to testify through our worship to the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in our final Abrahamic restorative, reparative monotheism, we have that in a very clear form. We have this in a very clear form where the Aql, the mind, and the forehead, which is close to it, which is the symbol of our pride, gets pressed appropriately into the dust. And that is where Imam al Juwaini worshipped and achieved his true greatness. And that is where Ibn Hajar worshipped and achieved his true greatness. And all the great Salih ulama of this ummah have achieved their real greatness as scholars on the sajada, not in the lecture room, because ultimately it all leads into their integrative, holistic, complete, single-minded, mukhlis project to turn themselves into luminous and extraordinary and selfless human beings.
And when the soul is reconfigured like that, it can do extraordinary things as a scholar. How did they memorize hundreds of thousands of hadiths? How did they have these photographic memories? How did they write hundreds of books? It's like a miracle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a certain orderliness in their minds because they have only one intention. They're single-minded. They're compassionate, they have families, they do their hajj, but they're so single-minded and pure in the way they think that the usual rubbish which wastes our time is not there. And they can be productive. And productive not just of any old kalam, but of witnessing to the one which our natures constantly shy away from, but which ultimately our souls crave. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us ulama, who act upon their knowledge and bear witness to the unity and the compassion of, of, of the Creator, and also servants of the ulama, and to identify uh, be the best ways in which we can serve the fundamental purpose of humanity, in which alone we can find the true heart's ease, which is to know our Creator and to love and adore and serve our Creator, insha'Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولي المتقين نكال الظالمين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله الملك الحق المبين محمد رسول الله صادق الوعد الأمين أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله فإنه خير الزاد وإياكم محدثات الأمور فكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار واعلموا أن الله قد أمركم بأمر عظيم أمركم بالصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين فقال جل ثناؤه إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم إننا نسألك رضاك والجنة وأنا أعوذ بك من سخطك والنار يا عالم السر منا لا تهتك الستر عنا وعافنا وقف عنا وكلنا حيث كنا يا ذا الجلال والإكرام أمتنا على دين الإسلام ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وأدخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ووافق الله مولاة أمور المسلمين إلى العمل بكتاب الله وصنة خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين عباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم وادعوه يستجب لكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة